and I want to welcome you all. I'm really looking forward to hearing your stories. Every story of folks helping to save our planet gives me hope and encouragement to keep at it. We need some of those positive words now and then. I believe what we do locally and visibly is very important. It models what needs to happen everywhere. It can be contagious, even become popular. What is popular affects our government representatives. President Obama speaking of uh, public policy once said, make me do it. Each home that is electrified, each bus ride replacing a car ride, each tree planted in a tree barren neighborhood, each wind form or solar panel installed, each city's climate action plan passed makes a difference that can multiply when visible and bragged about. So tonight, let's do some bragging. Tomorrow, let's write our congregational reps. <laughs> and I hope tonight we will share ideas of what individuals and congregations can do on many levels. So um, let it all come out. <laughs> So while my house in Oregon was being built, I stayed in Seattle with my friends, Mona and Dick. That's where I know her from. <laughs> they attended the Saltwater um, congregation, New York congregation, and I went along with them. After the service, they attended the climate action group that met in a religious education classroom. The room was full. The agenda was full. People were happily sharing the climate projects that they were working on. Soon after that, Mona and I were talking about planting trees and we decided to see if saltwater would do the same because they have quite a bit of land. Mona called her church friend, Jean Spawn, who plants trees and she agreed to bring the idea to the climate. They said yes and soon there was a work party to pull up the invasive ivy on the church acreage so that later trees could be planted. And they have since been planted and are growing away. And I've been using the example of saltwater ever since, and it led to the idea of this webinar. And I'm happy to introduce devoted climate activists, Mary Painter and Sherry Jacobson, who will give their own and saltwater's story. We're very eager to hear from you. So again, so let me, my name is Mary Painter and um, a couple of, well, one thing I wanted to say before I start to tell our story, is just that uh, I often mull over why, why is it so hard to get any traction and any real progress on this issue? And um, I remember that this, this is not original with me. Other people have pointed out that human beings are just not wired for long range threats, you know, we're, we're wired to hear the rustle in the bushes and think, hey, it might be a saber tooth tiger. That's kind of in our DNA. And that's the kind of threat that we're best at responding to. And so it makes it very difficult. There's always something more seemingly more imminent that we should deal with. And yeah, so it's just hard. It's, there's no question it's hard. It's the same mechanism really when we start talking about you know social security and medicare are running out of money and if we don't do something if we do it now it'll be so much easier than if we do it later and it's like yeah 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 because there's ways other places to put the money and so we don't do it now and then it is harder later and it's the same thing with climate um and there's a couple other major challenges which are that there's huge forces arrayed against us very you know flush with cash and uh, main, mainly the fossil fuel industry. And um, they've used the same tactics that they used against the tobacco industry, just sowing enough doubt that people will say, oh, you know, the science isn't in yet. We better not take any action. And let's wait and see until the science is all settled. You know, so, so that's a couple just prefatory remarks. Um, so now to talk about how saltwater got started. Uh, well, back in 2014, I was just coming off, this is fall of 2014, I was just coming off a three-year stint on the board of directors of Saltwater, including the last year was being president. And so I was not looking for a new project. I was looking to kind of sit back and 
rest on my laurels. Um, but I happened to go to the 2014 climate march in Seattle and I, uh, I saw other Unitarian universities there with Unitarian UU t-shirts and they were marching and there were even people from our church that were marching that I didn't know were gonna go. And I thought, why, why did we not get together and carpool? This is, this is silly. And so then that seed, that was the seed that plans like, we should have a climate action team at Saltwater. I wonder who could lead it, <laughs> you know? And um, a little time went by, a couple of months in fact, and I kept wondering, we, we know we need to do this. This is obviously the big, one of the big issues of our time. And um, finally, I you know, I guess it's gonna have to be me. So I, the way it works in our church is we just put a little message out and we say, hey, we're thinking of starting a new group. We need about five people who are willing to be active. Now you may have different processes in your church, but that's ours. You have to have about five people that are willing to get involved and be active before you can start a new group. So put that message out, got the five people and we held our first meeting and I think it was in January of 2015. And so, um, we, we, over the next couple of months, we did a couple of things. We realized we were small and likely to stay small because our church is small. So we couldn't be very effective unless we joined with other churches and with some of the major environmental groups like the Sierra Club and Washington Environmental Council and groups like that, Audubon Society. So those are some things we recognized early on. Um, and we were lucky enough to hook up through the Sierra Club with a mentor who's, who's helped us get up to speed and to read and learn the most pertinent things that we needed to know to move forward. And so that, that was really helpful. And so I recommend that highly is network and join up with the other groups. Um, when we first started, we, we tried, well, we spent some time devising our goals because, you know, it's easy to expand from climate change and carbon emissions into environmental policy, which can include toxics and uh, recycling and um, you know all kinds of things, soil and water conservation, agricultural methods, and they're all related. And, but we thought, you know, we're gonna do best if we focus on reducing carbon emissions, just keeping it really, really um, nailed down. So that's what we did. We actually wrote down goals and we also we had the goal of that of the carbon emissions and the other goal was to was to increase awareness in our congregation so sort of an educational function and then taking steps as individuals and encouraging the congregation to take steps in their personal lives that would um, be part of the solution so we didn't we didn't want to be too too um, vulnerable to the charge of being hypocritical well how did you get to the march i drove sorry you know so um so that happens so we, and when it's all never pure we always we're all contributing to the problem so we recognized we couldn't be pure but we had to do the best we could um so some of the early experiences that were formative were um we went to some indigenous led events and i remember talking to a young man from the lummy tribe which is up north of seattle and um just a casual conversation, but I just said, hey, tell me a little bit about, you know, your life and the, what the Lemmys are up to. And he, and he said, as a child, as a young boy, I, I used to go to the beaches and I could pick up the clams and take them home and cook them and eat them. And, and now the beaches where we used to get the clams are covered with coal dust. So that had a big impact on me as I visualized that, what that's like, because we were, we had a plague of coal trains in our state. And as they progressed through the countryside, they just left a spew of uh, coal dust everywhere, but especially painful in those, those sensitive areas. So um, just coincidentally in that year, 2015, Shell Oil companies wanted to start drilling in the Arctic. Well, they had already done some exploratory drilling, but they wanted to get into it in a big way. And suddenly there was a campaign called Shell No. And uh, there were high activists that got into the water and we put tremendous pressure on the port commission and on Shell Oil. And we went to lots of events around that. And by the fall of that year, 
Shell Oil um, abandoned their plans to, to do Arctic drilling. And so that was kind of the first taste of, of victory. And of course, we were a small group. We didn't take credit for it, but we were part of it. So it was exciting. Um, one of the other really important things was we hooked up with um, Sightline Institute, which is a local nonprofit think tank that has a, a wealth of information about all of these related climate issues. They also were in housing and poverty. And so they have, they, they've branched out considerably, but they had a guy named Eric DePlace. Some of you may know of him at, at the time. And he had a framework. And I went to a kind of an all day workshop and heard this, heard this in depth. The framework is you've got sources of fossil fuels like Wyoming's Powder River Basin that's full of coal. And then you have markets and the markets, many of them are in Asia. So the task is how do we get the, the, the coal from Wyoming to Asia? Well, you have to get it through the coast of Washington through export terminals. And Eric DePlace came up with this framework what he, that he called the thin green line. And at the time there were 15 fossil fuel projects planned for the coast of Washington. So these would be uh, expansions of existing facilities, new coal export terminals, new oil refineries, new natural gas pipelines and refineries and export facilities. And so 15 separate projects, each one involving permitting processes and stuff, which we didn't know anything about. So we had to get educated on that because it's like, okay, we have to stop these, but how do we do it? Um, and so I want you to just visualize this thin green line as the barrier between these fossil fuels and Asia. We know if this stuff gets to Asia, it's going to be burned up and it's going to contribute to the problem. So that led us to, to find, to get up to speed. Well, how do we, how do we go to a hearing? How do we write comments? How do we testify? We don't know anything, you know, and all I can say is we just, we just jumped in. We made, we made lots of mistakes um in our group as a whole we, but we learned as we went and um some things you know we did work and others not so much and we learned and we had to learn to laugh at our own mistakes eventually anyway so we testified like crazy we petitioned we wrote notes we began to, we also had issues in the legislature so we lobbied in the legislature i'm kind of watching my time here um and we just we, we did it all we did phone banking doorbelling petitioning tabling in our welcome room we always wanted to be visible so we got t-shirts with uu on them um and it's you know that we could the legislators learn to see us coming here we are in our cobalt t-shirts you know oh no here's the climate group again because they were doing nothing so it was pressure learning how to be lobbyists um a couple other things just briefly and i'll turn this over to margo next is um we we learned that it's, we want to build a team that has group cohesion. So it's not enough to say people come together and then they get a task and they go home and do it. We wanted them to feel part of this team. And so they would be uh, motivated to continue because they're <coughs> depending on them. So ways we did that. We always had a check-in at our meetings. <coughs> learned more about each other. Um, if we went to an event and testified, we tried to build in some fun. <coughs> Maybe it was, catching dinner on the way home or just a glass of wine at someone's house and things like that. And visibility is really important. So t-shirts, we have a big banner that we would take to, to our uh, state capital. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting lots of things. Um, the other, the last point I will make is that um, our minister at the time said, don't guilt trip people because people, when, when people feel guilty, then they feel resentful. And that's not what you want. So if you come on preachy and say, you know, you got to stop eating meat, don't drive your car. Um, incremental is better. Less meat, less driving, and that kind of thing. And avoid the guilt trips. Okay, that wraps me up. I think, Margot. Well, although I sent you lots of information, I don't have it in front of me. Okay. <laughs> so just let me tell you a little bit. About, okay. Uh, uh, what I said about how I started, because um, I taught school and in the 90s, I helped uh, some students who were really super in so many ways, but they wanted to form an environmental club. 
And I said, uh, well, they needed a, an advisor, otherwise they couldn't do it. I said I would do it. And we named the club SAFE, and, and that was Students Acting for the Environment. And although it was environment in general, uh, we were on the way to climate because it's all related. Um, and I worked with them and I still hear from some of them, you know, 20 and 30 years later. Um, and um, so it was part of who I am for a long time. And so when this, uh, we, we were out to lunch and we heard about this uh, rally up in, in Seattle and we ended up, why aren't we just saying, why aren't we there? And it was a church luncheon or after church luncheon. So there were several people. And so we got together and headed for um, Seattle. And that was sort of the beginning, as she said. And I remember we had a meeting at the church in which we, because the church is small, the, the, they were trying to pinpoint things that we should work on. And we had this meeting where we we're all sitting at the tables and talking, and then we voted, and then we put our choices up on, on little stickers up on a window. And we couldn't, you know, all the people who wanted to work on hunger or on child care or whatever, they filled the windows and there weren't all that many with, with uh, climate. And, but we persisted. <laughs> we decided we were still going to work on it. And, and um, I think that knowing that Mary and then, was, then suddenly we have Nancy and we have Bill and we have Sherry uh, started small. And so if you start small, just keep persisting. Be, keep trying because um, people will, will come if you get it started, I do believe. Um, and she, Mary has talked about many of the points. I'm trying to think if there, we did do some church services, uh, right. which, which is something that she didn't mention. Uh, we also had speakers come in a few times and that helped. And, um, uh, you know, at one point, uh, we sort of had a play going where Mary would played the part of, <laughs> of, of, uh, one climate person and I another, and that's how we led the service that day. Um, we did have some people who were naysayers, I will say. They're good Unitarians, but they, they, they disagreed with us. And we had to say, you know, so be it. Um, but we had to keep on. And I remember yet some of the tables that we had set up as, um, with with information sometimes someone would come up and and basically say that we they disagree with us totally that that uh, this was not a, a big issue but i do believe they've all changed their minds and um so anyway i could answer questions at the end or something if you have any or i would attempt to but i appreciate the opportunity just to share my little story and and um, I'm still in my own way. I'm on the other side of the country right now, but in my own way, I am working on the environment from, from Massachusetts right now. So, but my heart is still in at salt, at salt water and scan. Thanks, Margo. So Sherry. Well, Marco and Mary have done a great job of, of filling you in. I'm just gonna give a, a little more detail about what we do to keep uh, our, our team and our actions in front of our congregation. Um, I recently read a survey, you may have too, about how the majority of Americans support climate policies, but they don't think other citizens do. So they feel like they're in a minority and um, they are, they're acting alone. So I think what we do is, is when we have teams and, and climate groups and we keep that out in front of people, I think that's important because it helps them see that they're not alone and that other people are working and will help support them. So um, Marco mentioned the climate services and we do have those annually. 
Uh, we try to schedule them now, at least the last couple of years, we've tried to schedule them around Earth Day. Um, doesn't always work because of the church calendar we have had them at different times of year. We do have, um, sometimes we have outside speakers come in. It might be one speaker, might be several speakers. Um, sometimes it's individuals from our church who, who speak about a topic that, uh, that's climate related and important to them. Um, and the feedback I've gotten from the congregation is that that's really meaningful to them. They get a lot out of it and they remember the services. On a weekly basis, uh, there's a client, we do a climate message of the week. It's in our online church newsletter. In various members have written that in the past. Currently, I'm writing it. Uh, there are lots, climate touches everything, so it's easy to find topics. And I try to vary that so I hit something that somebody is interested in. I've had feedback that about 100 words is a good length that people will read and pay attention to. And I try to put in each, each week, try to have an action or a link to resources so people have, they read, but then they have something to do and some, some way to participate in the, the message. We also, to keep things in front of the congregation and, and to involve them, we um, have a listserv, we put things on the listserv. We have an email list for SCAN for our climate team so that people who don't necessarily come to the meetings can stay up with, it, with our actions and what we're doing. It's interesting, we, um, not long ago, our leader emailed everybody and said, do you wanna stay on the list? And even though our meetings are fairly small, we have a bigger list of people who follow what we do and want to stay updated on what we do. Um, this helps so when there is a legislative action something that an event or legislative action we can let people know and uh, I think it's always great when we put the word out you know there's there's a call you can make a, a comment you can write and people who are not in our group will reply I did it you know thanks for letting me know so that's that's good news and we like to hear that um, I think some of the, I'm not sure if it was Mary or Margo mentioned when we meet, did meet in person before the pandemic, we did tabling. And that was another way to keep, uh, keep what we were doing after the service. So uh, other congregation knew things were going on and that we were busy working. Um, one thing, Mary did a great job with covering the visibility that we have outside of our community. I think I've heard we have a reputation as the climate group that's active in our part of King County. Um, and I know at least one of our members came, who doesn't attend Saltwater came to us through um, meeting people at public events. And she kept seeing the same people at these events and she wanted to know who they were and talk to them. And it was Mary and Margo and some other Saltwater climate team members. And she decided that she wanted to be part of the group and now she's one of our most active members. So that, that visibility outside the community can draw other people in. Something that hasn't been mentioned that doesn't, it doesn't necessarily connect to our name, but I think it's a great way to get the climate message out is we have people who are active writing letters to the editor. And we've had a good success rate doing that. And um, the uh, Seattle Times, I checked, not too long ago. And if you can get a letter to the editor in the Sunday Seattle Times, uh, it can reach up to 700,000 people. So that's a great way to get a climate message out. And we have some great writers for those letters. So that's something I would recommend for anybody who, who's interested in climate or has a climate team, is get people writing letters. I think one of the things that's made our group so effective in terms of we are a small group, but I think we've been pretty effective in, in um, climate action is we have a diverse group of people who have different interests. I know Mary mentioned fossil fuel and we're all, all on that, on board on that, but other people have specific interests in solar or maybe aviation. And my, my, food, my issue is food 
food issues. And so people in the group will research and uh, report back to the group on what's happening, uh, especially during the legislative sessions. Uh, individuals will take individual bills and track those bills and bring that information before the group. And that way we can cover a lot more than if we're all trying to do a little bit of everything. So I think that's one of the secrets to our success in uh, making a difference. Um, so that, Mary and Margo did such a good job. I don't think I have to add anything else. Well, I have one more thing to say, which is I got all excited and I forgot to say with regard to the thin green line on these fossil fuel projects along the coast of Washington is that when we organized, um, and that means organized with all of the big groups, the Sierra Club and other huge environmental groups to testify and to really put the pressure on these fossil fuel companies and on the regulators that are going to have to give the permits for them to build these facilities. We defeated every single one of them as long as we organized. So that was very exciting. This was in the early days, back in 2015. I'm, these projects tend to come back and like zombies, they rise from the dead and then you have to fight them again. But that was, that was just incredible to realize that, that, talk about your grassroots efforts. You really can have a, a difference. And that was just because Washington through an accident of geography, we just happened to be, you know, the people that have the thin green line. Then it also extends through Oregon and, and, and British Columbia, but we're really, we were really on the front lines. So it, we, we felt, you know, important and not that we did, you know, very much, but we were part of it. We were part of it. That was the exciting thing. So I think we've gone well over our time. So thank you, Lucy. Thank you.